everyone, Cleo here and today I am rounding off the month of June. So uh, we are midway through the month at this point, uh, midway through the year at this point, which, uh, yeah, surprising, but hey, uh, time flies as always. So um, that, <laughs> my cats are super uh, excited because there are two like um, sparrows on my balcony. <laughs> So if they are kind of fixated, if this one, the other one you cannot see, is somewhat fixated, you know on what. Um, so we are midway through the year and uh, the month of June was quite a good month. It was quite a different month for me reading wise this year because I had stepped away from the concept of a fixed TBR. And <laughs> But so this was the first time that I returned to the fixed TBR after having had like a lot more freedom in terms of my reading choices for a while. Um, and it was a mixed experience, you know, I somewhat liked the fact of challenging myself to read these in order to try and finish all of them. On the other hand, uh, I did definitely miss some of the freedom of just being able to pick and choose, being able to put books in there uh, like last minute because of my preferences. So uh, this was also a super hard TBR in the sense that I also had a TBR in order. Uh, and it was also a little bit too ambitious, so I had to switch things up at the end. But So I'm going to go through the books in reverse order, basically, because that's the order in which they are still in the pile. And then, as every month, I will also go through the books that I have purchased and make up a balance of how many unread books are still on my shelves at this point. So at the beginning of this month, I was at 128 unread books on my shelves. Let's see how I did. So, last book that I finished this month is Queenie by Candace Carty Williams. So I'm gonna try and go over this pretty fast. I might actually film a separate review for this one, but I absolutely adore this one. I gave this five stars. It's probably one of my, it's probably at the same level as an orchestra of minorities for me at this point. So it's also one of my top reads for this year. So Queenie is often referred to as a black Bridget Jones diary and it's indeed a book about a uh, black girl living in the UK who uh, her boyfriend has just broken up with her, they're on a break and uh, she kind of falls apart. Not just her love life, she starts to go, uh, she starts to have a lot of casual relationships, a lot of just um, rough sex as well uh, and a lot of just sex and then never seeing the guys again or the guys never reaching out to her again. Uh, also in terms of her job she isn't focusing on all of and she's getting a lot of warnings and a lot of um, problems at work uh, and so we're very much looking at indeed this sort of a situation which is very reminiscent of Bridget Jones Diary but the book is a lot more deep than I think Bridget Jones Diary was. I mean I'm going by the movie here not the book because I haven't read the book but this one delves into racism a lot. This book very much shows how different of a reality this is for a black woman. So uh, not only in terms of her sexual relations are we shown how she's very much objectified by these men and uh, and the way in which she's objectified in a different way than uh, white women would be. The way in which uh, she's not taken seriously at her job when she tries to um, talk about more serious subjects, when she tries to get uh, Black Lives Matter movement content into her writing. And apart from looking at these sort of issues, the issues surrounding racism, the issues about her having to deal with microaggressions, with um, objectifications, with uh, prejudices, it also looks at uh, mental health. So she is struggling a lot and she has, suffers from a lot of anxiety. Even when she was still in a relationship, she's very much a person who needs um, reassurance. She's very much insecure herself. And so we will go through these issues as well throughout this book. I thought it was absolutely wonderful. It also is super funny. You know, a Black Bridget Jones diary, it definitely makes, uh, it definitely does come true in the sense of the uh, humor that is in Bridget Jones diary. It just adds a little bit more of depth, a little bit more of, um, the harshness of reality into this one, but I would absolutely recommend this one to anybody. 
Anybody needs to read. Everybody needs to read this. I absolutely adore this one. Then I did a reread for The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho. So The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho is a book that I had to read in high school. I have fond memories about it and in hindsight after rereading it now I think it was probably more suited to my reading taste as a teenager. It's probably it's something that it's a highly inspirational, highly motivational, spiritual book and uh, at this point in my reading life I can uh, acknowledge it, I can um, enjoy that but it's not something that's blowing me away anymore. At this point in time I want a book to be more nuanced, a book to carry a little bit more load and so in this one we are following a boy called Santiago and Santiago is a shepherd living in Spain. He became a shepherd because he loves to travel and one day he has a dream that if he goes to the pyramids in Egypt he will find a treasure there and so an adventure uh, unfurls. It's very much a book about following your dreams and uh, it's very much looking in at um, the obstacles that are thrown your way when you're trying to pursue your dreams and the way in which um, people let go of their dreams and the way in which people uh, settle for less. Uh, and so it's very much inspirational in that sense and I definitely think that a 17 year old me who was like at the brink of starting her adult life would have absolutely absolutely fell in love with this whole message 32 year old me is like yeah i get that message and i definitely do think it's still valid at this point in life as well but i don't think that there are some nuances to this uh, message that aren't brought into the story because it's very much intended to be inspirational. But next up, this is a disappointment. One star read, uh, Leon and Juliette by Amiette van der Zeel. This is a book week gift, so it's a free gift we get in Belgium if you purchase a book during book week. This is a book about a uh, Dutch person in the 1820s who moved to Charleston, USA, fell in love with a black slave there bought her freedom and took her and his family with him to the Netherlands. It's very much um, a disappointment because it seems to be a romanticized non-fiction but it definitely reads more like just a summary uh, of historical events rather than to it actually reading like a novelization. Uh, like the first chapter or something is, the, is, is written in a engaging style but after that we are always just like given the facts and just never made to engage with this story. Not that I think that that was possible in 90 pages because my trepidation going into this was like how are you going to deal with such a complex uh, problematic subject matter in 90 pages and she just doesn't. She, does, she shies away from that by just showing bare facts. She is actually working on a full-length novel about this but so yeah wasted my time on this one. Uh, then we have the mystery that is King Lear by William Shakespeare. I read it, um, well, I actually listened to it and yeah, Shakespeare and me, I, I just don't get what he's trying to say. I mean, I got it a little bit just because I knew the play so I could recognize what was happening in it and I can recognize that he's had a huge impact on literature. The problem is just that I don't enjoy listening to his works so I'll probably just stick to like retellings or to um, like movies in, in which his plays are being portray portrayed because I just don't get too much out of reading his actual work. Next up, one that I will skip discussing until we get further down the pile and that is Kingdom of Copper by S.A. Chakraborty because I also read the first book in the series this month so hang on for this one for a little bit longer. <laughs> Next up, The Year Without Summer by Guinevere Glassford. This is a uh, literary fiction novel, it's a historical fiction novel uh, taking place mainly in 1816. This is a year after a uh, volcano erupted in Indonesia and the effects on global climate are kind of looked at here. So of course nobody at that time was aware of this impact and I think it took until like very recent for uh, scientists to actually uncover the uh, the links between the volcano eruption and the sort of like uh, drought, famine and stuff like that happening uh, at other places in the world. But so uh, we are looking at very diverse cast of characters and the impact that uh, this um, 
event had on uh, global weather systems, on uh, agriculture, on social unrest because um, so in lots of places in the world there was like drought or there was extreme weather so it's called the year without summer because for example in the US it was snowing in summer at that point in time and so a lot of crop failure was happening and because of that uh, the uh, schism between poor and um, middle class or poor and the rich grew even wider and there was a lot of social unrest, a lot of um, people from uh, lower class situations fighting for their rights, fighting for a better, um, better existence. And so we are looking at many different characters. We are also looking at Mary Shelley, who at that point in time is uh, off to Switzerland with her husband and with Lord Byron and uh, another guest. And they make a contest to write a scary story and that is the origin of the novel we all know as Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. So that is what first drew me into this book. I knew that it was, um, I had heard about this event and its impact on Frankenstein. And so when I heard somebody describe this and then uh, also mention the link with Frankenstein, I really wanted to read it. All in all, I think it's a, a mediocre read. I think uh, I do want to keep an eye out for more by Guinevere Glassford. I think this was a debut novel as well, because I think she manages to bring a lot of richness to her story, a lot of richness to her characters and her world. Uh, all of these characters felt very distinct from each other. They all had a very um, rich... Um, they were well thought out, they were well brought to the page. They had uh, a lot of depth to them and they had a lot of background to them. Uh, and I did definitely like some of the uh, characters more than others, which you often have, of course, with stories told from multiple perspectives. I think the perspective I personally preferred was the 1815 uh, perspective, which is the perspective of the person actually witnessing the volcano eruption, but that's also because I have a fascination with volcanoes, with uh, earthquakes, with natural disasters. So yeah, I just thought it was super uh, interesting to read these first-hand accounts of a volcano eruption and its immediate impacts. Um, I think it's interesting to look at this book because you know that what we're looking at is the impact of a volcanic, a volcanic, 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 Whatever, of a volcano erupting uh, in a time when people don't know these things happening. It was like it took a year, I think, for them to even hear about volcano eruption. But of course, nobody was aware of the uh, of the um, of the correlation between that event and what was happening in their own worlds. Next up, The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang. This has been on my radar for so long and I just kept putting it off, putting it off because I had so many books that I still wanted to get to and I still had so much fantasy that I still wanted to get to. But because so many people in the bookish community have started to read it lately, I definitely wanted to take that momentum and read it myself as well. Uh, I definitely did thoroughly enjoy this. I wouldn't say it's a five star read for me. So in this book we are following Rin. Rin is a... Um, Rin was orphaned during the second poppy war and she was kind of sent off to a family and uh, for them to raise her but they basically just considered her as like free labor and don't really treat her very well at all. So she wants to escape the situation especially since, the, sin, especially since her adoptive family family now wants to get rid of her and wants to marry her off to a rich um, person who has influence over the opium trade business in which her adoptive family are working in. Um, so she wants to escape the situation so she dives into studying for the uh, Kan... what was it? The Kirchu I think? Yeah, she dives into studying for the Kirchu so that she... which is this, um, like nationwide uh, exam that people take in order to get into certain academies. So she wants to participate in the Kutchu and she needs to get the highest mark because with the highest mark she can get into Cinebart, Cinegard, which is the uh, most prestigious uh, academy, which is a warrior academy and it's the only academy that would be free for her and so uh, if she gets into any other academy she still won't be able to go because she won't be able to afford it. So this is the basic premise of this, but we only spent like half of the book in Cinegard and that's basically my main problem with it is like the pacing of it is that we kind of get two very different books. In a sense I also like it because it very much shows like the 
switch that happens is very much a switch because of war and it very much shows how war comes very sudden, can come very suddenly and kind of disrupts life in the middle of their progress. This is a very cruel, very much a uh, showing war as it is uh, book and if you know anything about the Second Sino-Japanese War, then you will kind of know what you're going to be going into. So um, this is very much inspired on Chinese history. Because of the title, I expected it to be uh, inspired by the Opium Wars, but it's mainly inspired by the Sino-Japanese War. Mainly the uh, so that is the um, Chinese-Japanese conflict that was happening during World War Two. So um, there are some very cruel things happening in here, and you need to be aware of that before you go into this. Also, uh, Rin is a character who is very much self-destructive. She does things to herself that are very harmful. So. Um, at the very beginning, when she's studying for the Kochu, you already get instances of this. You know, she's burning her uh, hands or something in order to be able to stay awake to study more. And these types of behaviors will reoccur throughout this book. So she is very much a toxic character. She goes. She also has toxic relationships in this book, and um, she makes bad decisions all of the time. So it's not a character. You're not going to be rooting for this character necessarily, um, so it's very much a book that um, has these elements that can pull you, put you off of it, but I very much still enjoyed it. I loved its representation of war. I uh, very much liked um, also this look at a character that is darker, at a character that is doing, uh, that is making decisions that really aren't the best decisions. Um, and yeah, I think she was an interesting character to read from. It's an interesting world to read from, but I definitely want to continue on and see where she's going to go with this book. I know that she wants to kind of showcase how can somebody become a sort of dictator, you know? How does somebody become a Mao Zedong, for example? And I think the next books in the trilogy are also going to be uh, referencing to later parts of Chinese history, so I do think that we're gonna get a cultural revolution, for example, at some point in one of these books in this trilogy. So I'm very interested to see uh, where this story is going to go and um, how the rest is handled. I know it's quite divisive and I actually don't fall on the fully love it side, nor do I fall, fall on the fully hate it. I am closer to the loving it side, but there are some f flaws or some things in the development that just didn't feel fleshed out enough for me. Uh, next up, let's talk about Crooked Kingdom. So this is the sequel to Six of Crows, which I read in March, I think. Um, I've already more or less forgotten everything about this book, I must say. I feel like uh, I'm kind of like, wow, uh, this, did I read this this month? Okay. So in Six of Crows, we are following a cast of characters who are performing a heist. So they have been hired to um, go into a high like a maximum security prison, let's call it like that, uh, in another realm and to um, get a certain scientist out of there and bring him back with them. Um, certain things unfold at the end of book one and that lets, leads us to book two. Uh, book two is very much about getting even with certain characters that uh, take place because of events taking place in book one. Uh, and yeah, it was mediocre to me. I actually really don't remember too much, really really don't remember too much about this book so um, I think it's three star for me um, yeah I know that people say that they love these characters and actually care I, I do I don't have anything against these characters it's just that they are not top notch for me I didn't like the way the character the, the author um, fleshed out the characters in the earlier books and I do think we're going back to that style in this one where she just like establishes character through uh, character thinking back a character thinking back about their past which I don't necessarily like that to be the way in which you're establishing your characters um, and as with the first book I feel like there's a lot of um, conveniences in this book. There's a lot of conveniences with the plots that they draw and then even when there are setbacks they've thought of uh, contingencies for that and I, 
understand that that's the way most heist plot works, but I don't think it works because of the narrative technique being used. In this uh, book we are following all of the perspectives and so all, some of these perspectives have information about the contingency plan and we are never shown that information and uh, I feel I really feel the manipulation of the author in this one where that is concerned. You know, I very much feel like we are kept in the dark about certain things uh, intentionally by the author. Uh, and so the fact that I felt that so, uh, so clearly has made me not really like this one. So it was okay, but I am going to get rid of my copies of Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom because I just didn't love them. I didn't get anything out of them. They're not the best examples that I have on my shelves of that type of book. So yeah, sadly not for me. Next up, a very short one, and that will be Songs of Innocence and Experience by William Blake. So this is a collection of poetry by William Blake. It has like the original art piece on one side and then the poem on the other side. So it was very quick to get through. Um, yeah, I am not that great with poetry, but you can see that I did tab like three poems in here. Uh, I did quite like them. I enjoyed how they were all about a certain thematic and how certain poems would come back in the... Uh, that would exist both in the innocence and the experience part, but they would just have a different layer to them based on which part of the book they were placed in. So I did enjoy my read of it and I do definitely uh, still look back fondly to the exhibition that I saw about uh, William Blake in London. And then we circle back to City of Brass by S.A. Chakraborty. So I read City of Brass and Kingdom of Copper this month and I absolutely fell in love. Um, so this is Middle Eastern inspired fantasy. So in this we are following mainly our main character, Nadi. Nadi is a girl who was orphaned, living in uh, Cairo in Egypt. She's kind of a swindler in a little bit. She's kind of getting around by um, taking people's money by offering them like her uh, skills as a fortune teller or by um, pretending to be able to um, perform certain uh, exorcisms, let's call it like that, that uh, she doesn't really know what she's doing, for example. But while performing one of those rites, she uses a language that uh, she has known since childhood, but she's never found anybody else who uh, speaks this language. And uh, by speaking it, she invokes the, she draws the attention of a jinn. And so she's rushed off to the uh, city of jinns, Daevabad, because she turns out to have a quite interesting lineage. Um, I very much liked this book, I very much loved its references to Middle Eastern uh, folk tales and to Middle Eastern culture, to uh, Islamic uh, religion as well, because these are things that I have very little experience with, so I'm very much drawn to this um, this type of story. It's also, uh, and I very much loved seeing this type of uh, world and it felt so rich, so lush. And uh, I very much loved the characters that we were following. Least of all, Nadi, actually. I loved the two other main perspectives that we were following more. So we're following the perspective of Dada, who is a uh, Jin, who is the one who's kind of picking her up and forcing her into, uh, forcing her along with him to that uh, city. But also we're following Ali, who is a prince of the realm, but he is very much struggling with loyalty issues. So he is very much uh, one who's looking out for the interest of the uh, lesser of part of his population. And uh, he's kind of on the verge of betraying his family to do so. So he will be struggling throughout with his fate and what he feels is morally correct to do. And his loyalties to his family, to his, uh, to his family who he absolutely loves. So uh, I very much enjoyed this first one. Uh, I was a little bit let down by the second one, The Kingdom of Copper, in the sense that I don't like a narrative technique that you used at the beginning. So at the very beginning we get a sort of uh, prologue in which we get the immediate aftermath of book one and then we take a time jump of five, d uh, of five years. I think that that is lazy writing. I don't like it when five years just fly by like that, especially when those five years are five years in which a character has to rebuild himself. You know, I find it quite 
been quite lazy not to just show us that, to just have that go by and kind of wipe the slate clean in a manner of speaking. And also, um, it's very much suffers from me, in my perspective, of um, middle book syndrome. So I think there's a huge chunk of this book that didn't really do anything for me except for build up to the second book. So there's a whole, so our main, we are mainly following Nadi and Ali in this one. And then there's this tertiary perspective that we are following. And that one should have been left out for me. I don't want it there, but then it's definitely building up to book three. And so whole, all of the times that we were getting that perspective, I just felt like it wasn't necessary because we were getting so much more interesting things in Nadi's and Ali's um, plotline. And then at the very end, that third, that third perspective is getting drawn back in and we get the whole build up to the third book. But so uh, I definitely feel like the overall plotline was so much stronger for the rest of the book than it was for that particular point of it. While we were constantly being drawn towards that end point by having those interlacing parts uh, of the third perspective. And of course, because you're building up to the third book, I won't say leave those parts out because you can also not just drop a huge bomb uh, at the end of the book neither. But I do definitely take some. I do definitely think it takes a little bit away from me in any case of the second book. And so uh, we'll have to see. I'm currently started listening to the third book, Empire of Gold, which came out uh, on the 30th of June. I think I saw somebody already say it at that point. But I think it actually came out, or at least it was only available on script on the 1st of July, which is today. Um, I'm starting today, but it is a 28 hour, uh, 28 and a half hour audiobook, so uh, it'll take me a little bit to get through in any case. And then the final book that I have to talk about that I read in the month of June is The Traveling Cat Chronicles by Hiro Arikawa. This is a book about a um, cat, Nana. And Nana used to be stray, but then she um, kind of she found a sweet spot where she was always uh, laying down and a human was always visiting her and she was like barely tolerating him but then she got into a car accident and he helped her recover and she became his forever cat however at the beginning of this book we are uh, following them as uh, her owner Satoru as her owner Satoru has decided that he cannot keep the cat and he needs to find a new home for her And so they will go and visit people who have played a major part in his life and uh, as we're going along We're very much looking at this very deep bond between cat and owner But very much also at these human bonds and these human frailties because we're very much looking at people who feel like they've let down Satoru, people who feel like they've let down other people's people who have resentments. So it's very much looking at uh, human frailty and the, the frailty of human connections, but also at the strength of reconnecting, the strength of talking about issues that were plaguing you and uh, being able to heal old wounds. Um, so it's a little bit of a sad one, but it's also very much a wholesome one. Definitely did shed a tear with this one as well. Uh, I should also say, I definitely did also shed tears with Queenie. Um, uh, by Candice Carty Williams so this definitely also had a few tears in store for me but so yeah that's the books that I read so in total I read 11 books however one of these is a reread so it does not count for my uh, unread books challenge so let's say we've got not 10 <laughs> we've got 10 read books but then let's go into the books that I purchased so I bought <laughs> First of all, Clap When You Land by Elizabeth Acevedo. This is a uh, relatively new release. I don't know whether it came out in June or May, but it's very it's not that long that it's been out. So this is, I think, the third book by Elizabeth Acevedo. She is the author of The Poet X and With the Fire on High. I have not read any of her books so far. Um, I've always just considered them to really not to not really be my thing, but I definitely want to dive in at this point and definitely this particular plotline really intrigued me. So we are following two sisters, but they don't know about each other's existence, or they might know about each other's existence, but they haven't met in any case. They uh, are two half-sisters, so they share the same father, and their father would um, visit one of them every summer and then return to his real family for the rest of the year. So he has a daughter in the Dominican Republic, he has a daughter back home in New York. So when he passes away, that is when these two 
children will get introduced to each other, will find out about each other. In any case, uh, it sounds interesting. I'm very much looking at, uh, interested in seeing how we will deal with sisterhood in this book, uh, hoping to find a sort of redemption, redemptive sisterhood arc. Uh, so we'll see. Next up, I bought a non-fiction book, Congo, by David van Reybroek. This is a history of Congo. Um, so I am from Belgium and we colonized Congo in the 19th century. So I'm very much uh, looking forward to reading this book and finding out more about that dark page in our history that is definitely coming back to the foreground now. You know, because of um, Black, Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter movement, a lot of discussion is being rekindled about whether it is appropriate to have uh, statues of Leopold II in our public sphere. And um, I definitely don't want to see them there, but uh, I definitely also want to learn more about Congo and about the history of our colonial past, because it's something that's very much glossed over when we uh, were in high school. So we learned about it to some extent, but very little and uh, definitely not a lot, not enough about the atrocious uh, events that it, uh, occurred there and not enough about the impact that that had on Congolese history as a whole. I'm hoping it will not just um, place it in its like direct histor history, but it would also um, place it in the whole history of the Congolese region. But we'll have to find out when I read this one. And then the final one that I purchased is Cleopatra by Alberto Angela. This is a novelization of the... Um, no, it's not a novelization, I think. So this is a non-fiction book about Cleopatra, the last, last queen of Egypt. So I have a lifelong um, fascination with Egypt, with ancient Egypt. We went to Egypt when I was 10 and it was it's one of the holidays that will stick with me forever. I definitely do want to return at some point uh, and see it again now uh, as I'm a little bit older. But uh, yeah, I definitely want to learn more about Egypt and so I picked this one up. Um, my name does not come from Cleopatra by the way, so there is no link in that sense. Um, but so yeah, definitely want to dive into a little bit more of Egypt's history. So we finished 10 books purchase tree. So I've reduced the, the unread books by seven books this month. So I have 121 unread books on my shelves going into the month of July. So uh, definitely let me know if you've read any of these books, be it the ones that I've read, be it the ones that I still have to read, and uh, what your thoughts were on these. I would definitely like to talk to you guys about some of these. Definitely know that there's a lot of discussion to be had about uh, the Poppy War, for example. And uh, if you've read any of the books that I've madly fell in love with like City of Brass, like Queenie, definitely let me know down below. I'd love to gush about them along with you or defend why I liked them, I guess. But so yeah, see you guys for the next one.